Hello and welcome back. In this episode, we're going to have a look at how we can add an OAuth2 security scheme into our API and have that shown in the Swagger UI to allow uh, client applications or indeed the consumers of our API to authenticate directly through Swagger without having to write an application beforehand. So what we're going to want to do inside our API project, open up the startup class and you'll want to find where you do services.addSwaggerGen inside the configure services method. You'll notice this is currently set up to configure the Swagger doc. And what you're going to want to do underneath that is say options.addSecurityDefinition. And this is going to take a name, which we're going to call OAuth2. And it's going to, that is the second parameter, require a new OpenAPI security scheme, like so. Now this security scheme is going to be of type OAuth2. If your API uses other authentication protocols, then you can select the appropriate security scheme type here. But for this, we're going to link it with Identity Server using OAuth2. So we will select the OAuth2 type. And then we're going to enter the flows. So this is a new OpenAPI OAuth flows. And you'll see in here we have a list of flows or grant types. That's implicit, password, authorization code, and client credentials. We are going to, for this example, just set up the client credentials flow because we've already registered a console application with client credentials. That's a client ID and a client secret. So we use those client credentials in the Swagger UI to authorize ourselves and get an access token directly through the user interface. So client credentials equals a new OpenAPI OAuth flow. And you can see we have a list of properties to fill in. Now, because this is a non-interactive flow, it just uses the token URL to get access tokens. There's no refreshing involved and there's no authorization codes involved. So we will specify a token URL, which is a new URI, and that's HTTPS localhost 5001, and it's slash connect slash token like so. And you can get that token endpoint from the discovery document that Identity Server publishes by going to that slash well-known slash OpenID configuration. Next up, after token URL, we're going to want to create a dictionary of scopes that the API exposes through the client credentials grant type. Now, we've already created a single API scope just called API. However, if you had multiple scopes such as read, write, etc., you would add each of those individually as a key value pair into this dictionary. So the key inside the dictionary is the scope name, which is API. And this should match exactly what the scope is called in Identity Server. And then the description, we will just call it API, but you can put in any description there that describes what the scope does, because that description will be shown in the UI to consumers of your Swagger page. So this configures a new security scheme for OAuth2 with the client credentials flow. And what we're going to do now is actually apply this security scheme to the endpoints that require authorization. So to do that, you're going to want to right click on API, add a new directory, and I'm going to call this directory operation filters. And inside this folder, we're going to want to add a new class and I'm going to call it authorize operation filter and this class is going to want to implement i operation filter from the swagger gen nuget package and clicking on the red light bulb over here we can implement the missing members which in this case is the apply method now this uh, passes in an open api operation and an operation filter context now, the operation itself corresponds to the endpoint. Inside our weather forecast controller, we have an endpoint called get, and each endpoint is essentially an operation in the OpenAPI specification. Next up, we have the operation filter context, and this is the context that applies to each of the methods or operations as they're known. So what we're going to want to do first of all Rather than blanketly applying authorization to all of our endpoints, we're going to want to check to see if the endpoint actually has 
an authorised attribute applied to it. So what we can do inside this apply method is we can say if context.methodInfo.getCustomAttributes.ofType authorised attribute dot any and this will basically check to see if the endpoint has the authorized attribute in its list of custom attributes. However, you'll notice here we only have HTTP get as an attribute. The authorized attribute is actually applied to the encompassing class that's on the weather forecast controller. So what we're going to want to do is to check not only the endpoint method, but also the declaring class. So what we can do is we can say or context.methodInfo.declaring type not equal to null and the context.methodInfo.declaring type dot get custom attributes dot of type authorize attribute dot any and what this will check to see if the declaring type is not null and if it isn't null, does it have the authorized attribute in its list of custom attributes? Which you can see here it is, the second attribute in the list of attributes on that weather forecast controller. So what we can then do inside this if statement is we can, if this resolves to true, we can apply the authorization um, security scheme that we defined here in the startup. We can apply that to this particular operation. So first of all, what we can do is say operation.responses.add and we will say status codes dot status 401 unauthorized to string. And this will give us an open API response with a description of unauthorized, like so. What we can then do is the same thing again, but for a 403 forbidden because those are the two common status codes if the access token is invalid or if the client does not contain the appropriate permission. And the description of this one will be forbidden. And then what we can do, we can say operation.security equals a new list of security requirements. We can then say new open API security requirement. And this is a dictionary with the OpenAPI security scheme as the key and a list of strings as the value. So what we can do as the key, we can say new OpenAPI security scheme, like so. And this is going to be a reference to the scheme that we defined earlier in the startup class. So the reference is a new OpenAPI reference and its type is a security scheme here, like so because we're referring to a security scheme that we created earlier. And the idea of that security scheme is OAuth2. That idea of OAuth2 should match exactly what we've created as the security definition in our startup class. There you can see it's called OAuth2. And this is how we then refer to it back using that same OAuth2 identifier. Now this basically, using this reference basically means that we don't have to keep defining this entire security scheme in every place that we want to reference it. We can simply define it once in the startup, have all of the logic self-contained in one place in the startup, and we can then just reference it using the reference property in the OpenAPI security scheme within the requirement. So that is the key of the dictionary, and now we have a list of strings as the value. So this can be a new list of strings, and this is the list of scopes to apply to this security requirement. So you can see here we've applied the API scope because that is the only scope that we have registered for this API. However, if you had different scopes, for example, read, write, etc., then you could add additional logic in here to filter your particular operations or endpoints and then apply the appropriate list of scopes, whether that be read, write, or both read and write depending again on the attributes and other values that you choose. So what this will do is it will add a default 401 response to the list of possible responses. It will do the same for a 403 forbidden response. And then it news up 
our OpenAPI security requirement, referencing the security scheme that we created in the startup with a scope of API, because that's the only scope that we have added for this particular API. So if we now click on the drop down of our run configurations, select API, and if we now run this API project, it will take a moment to build and open up the browser. And you can see that we have the authorized button now enabled in the top right. However, you can see that we don't actually have a padlock on this weather forecast endpoint. So what we can do is we can come back into our identity server and we can double check our logic to ensure that that particular operation is being uh, caught inside this authorized operation filter. And we can see we've got get custom attributes of type authorized attribute, which is the correct attribute. And we're doing the same thing down here with our declaring type. However, we haven't registered this operation inside the startup. So this is the important last step to come into startup. And underneath our add security definition, you're going to want to say services dot, uh, not services, sorry, you're going to want to say options dot operation filter, and then whatever we called our operation filter, which in our case is authorized operation filter. So without this operation filter line in here, you can see it sets up the authorized button with our appropriate authorization, but it won't actually apply that to the endpoints. So what we do is then use this operation filter to link that operation filter with the Swagger configuration. And if we now stop and rerun the application, when it reopens, we should find that we now have a padlock on that weather forecast endpoint. So it's important to not only create the operation filter, but to also then add that operation filter into the Swagger configuration inside the startup like so. So now what we can do is we can come into our API and we can click on the padlock and it asks us to enter our client credentials. So our client ID was console and our client secret was secret. And we can tick the API scope because that is the scope that's required to uh, authorize with this API. And if we then hit the authorize button, give it a few moments to load and we can see we get a type error failed to fetch. And if we press F12 to open up the uh, developer tools, we can see the connection to slash connect slash token was refused. And that's because we need to have the identity server also running in the background. So if we spin up the identity server like so, have that running in the background. And if we attempt the authorization again, give it a few moments to load. And you can see here, we now get a cause error. Now that's because the Swagger UI is running in a JavaScript. So it needs to be registered as a, a cause origin within our identity server. So what we can do is come back into our IDE. We can close these because we are done with those for now. And we can come down to our identity server. And inside our program class, we have our configuration DB context that, that allows us to interact with the uh, database context. And we can say configuration db context dot clients dot add. And I'm simply going to add a new uh, client for our Swagger UI. We say dot to entity to convert into a database entity. And we can then say dot save changes like so. And this client, I'm just literally going to give it a client ID of Swagger. And I'm then going to give it an allowed cause origins, which is a new list of strings. And inside this list, I'm going to say HTTPS localhost port 5003, because that is what the, the web API is running on. You can see here the warning in the terminal saying cause policy service did not allow origin localhost port 5003. So what we can do with this client ID of Swagger and allowed cause origins of 5003 is to now rerun this identity server. And what it will do is it will build and it should spin up 
our identity server into the browser, like so. And if we now open up our identity server database, and if we take a look in our list of clients, you can see we have a client for our console application, and we now have a client for Swagger with a client ID of two. So if we look at our client cause origins, you can see client ID two is configured with a cause origin localhost 5003. So what we can now do is we can come back into Swagger and we can attempt to authorize again. And with a bit of luck, you can see this time we now have our client ID and client secret and a bearer token back for us. We can ignore those prompts in Chrome because we're just using that um, weak secret of just secret. Again, in production, you want to make that something secure. And we can close the console now because we're done with that. And if we close, we can see the padlock is closed and we are now authorized to be able to send a request to this endpoint. So if we come into here, we can see our default responses of 401 and 403 that we configured in the operation filter. Those are listed here as uh, responses that we could get back from the endpoint. And if we click on try it out, and if we click execute, you can see here that we have a list of weather forecasts in our response body. And you can see here, it successfully sent the bearer token that we got from our authorization. So that is how you can add an old 2 security scheme into your Swagger configuration. And it's how you can then enable the authorized to link up with identity server, adding that cause origin into our identity server configuration so that the Swagger UI can send a request to the token endpoint with the client ID and client secret that we've entered for our console application. And this then means that uh, consumers can use this Swagger UI with their client credentials to authenticate and send requests without having to actually write any code or create any applications. So I hope you found this episode useful. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.